slip capital femoral epiphysis continues to bedevil us. And at first blush, it seems to be a pretty straightforward thing. Um, and for the uninitiated, it, it does seem to be pretty straightforward, but it's one of those conditions that the more we think about it, the more problematic it may be. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose here. Uh, Min Coker and I have written a, a book through Lippincott that we get uh, uh, some royalties for. But the bottom disclosure is I share your frustration at not yet sorting out better what perhaps should be a simple orthopedic problem, which is slip capital femoral epiphysis. There's an update volume which, uh, which I results and I put together which really uh, summarizes some of the latest thinking. But the problem is that there are some controversial issues. Uh, I want to increase the interest uh, of all of you in answering some mutual questions uh, direct you to what we think some relevant studies are and begin or continue a dialogue over time and plead with all of us to continue to collect prospective studies on slipped epiphysis. I'll acknowledge lots of people here. Um, some of them are in the room, some not in the room. Uh, Dennis has already acknowledged some of these in his lecture. So why discuss slips? Well, mild slip, just put a screw in it, right? I mean, the limp gets better. And they remodel, right? Um, Long-term prognosis, pretty good. They did pretty well in Iowa, right? The more you mess with it, the worse it is. Isn't that right? And they did figure out all this stuff in Iowa a long time ago with good long-term studies, right? And for some of you residents, once you graduate, you maybe never will see a slip again, right? So let's talk about something more interesting, and there probably are more interesting talks later in the morning. But for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about slips. So wait a minute. Um, why might slips be of interest? Well, there's an obesity pandemic. And uh, Peter Cundy and others have talked about how the slips are getting common, they're common and getting commoner, the demographics are changing. Adam Nasruddin has talked about this in our group. And there's really more associated morbidity than generally known. The morbidity is often subtle. Many patients with healed slips have minimal symptoms because they're not very active. And much of the morbidity is slowly cumulative. But it is a surgical problem, and that theoretically could make it fun and profitable for some of us. Let's focus on more associated morbidity. It's often subtle. Remember that, as Henry Mankin has told some of us, uh, articular cartilage can be giving you the primal scream, but nobody hears it. It doesn't really have a voice because it's insensate. So many patients have minimal symptoms also because they're not very active. And again, most of the morbidity is slowly cumulative. But this is really a rich area for the intellectually curious to investigate. And several of us in the department have looked at various aspects of this and continue to do so. Because if one scratches the surface, much of the dogma doesn't stand up to contemporary scrutiny. And so I think there is lots more to slips than just a more or less unstable slip in an overweight pre-adolescent. So there are common half-truths and misconceptions about slips. The most abnormal part of the hip in the slip is the physis. Is that true? Maybe, maybe not. The patient's habitus at greatest risk is the overweight pre-adolescent male. Maybe, maybe not. The unstable slip is an acute onset problem. The unstable slip is unstable, and the stable slip is stable. Maybe not. Um, surgical dislocation is risky treatment for an unstable slip. And that sort of depends. And slips do pretty well over time. Well, it depends on what you mean by pretty well. So practical fact, every, every hip with post-slip deformity has FAI. And there are lots of studies that talk about this in different ways. But even the long-term quoted studies of uh, Carney and Boyer, they didn't recognize nice FAI yet. But all the groups worsened over time. And it may be that that was because of FAI. So what's going on besides the slip and slip capital femoral epiphysis? Systemically, the other hip, et cetera. The acetabulum, it turns out that it's often very abnormal. So what is the acetabular morphology? Well, Woody Sanker got interested in this along with Brian Brighton. So Young Joe and, and I and uh, Woody and Brian looked at the acetabular morphology. And it turns out that if you look at this uh, x-ray, and I'll apologize for those of you who are not clinicians, but these are pretty deep sockets. And the acetabulum is not viewed as a part of the problem with slips, but these are very deep sockets that are retroverted. And so we looked at a number of patients with, uh, with some controls. And it turns out that as a group, the contralateral hip in slips, and we didn't look just at the slip tip at the other sides, the crossover sign was more common, posterior wall sign more common, higher CE angles, lower tonus roof angles. We didn't do false profile views in this study, but the fact is the acetabulum is often abnormal in slips. Now, it's hard to know whether that causes the slip or whether it just makes the FAI worse once the slip happens. Not clear, but something to look at. 
What are other patient-related factors? Important variables in slips. Clearly, the physial stability, the degree of deformity can relate to how much FAI there is, activity level, habitus, and there are some surgeon-related factors, which we often don't factor into our decision-making. But the bottom line is, in this group, uh, the contralateral acetabular morphology was something we think about, and as surgeons, maybe it's something we should do something about. This is a 19-and-a-half-year-old girl who was pinned for a moderate slip, a uh, stable slip. Her pain went away, but a few years later the pain came back. She has a big cam lesion, but she also has an overcovered hip. And her anterior center ridge angle was more than 40 degrees. This is clearly not normal. So when I treated her, I did something to the acetabulum as well to the cam. We did an osteoplasty to restore the offset, and it made her a lot better, at least in the short run. And of course, Dennis, we don't know whether this hip's going to last a long time. It probably isn't because she had a lot of arthritis in the hip. But the point is that you probably should look beyond the physis, not just at the femoral neck, but perhaps at the acetabulum too. There's lots of early mechanical damage. Michael Leuning and Reinhold Gans looked at this first. We've done a number of hips that we've looked at arthroscopically, mostly bang. And uh, he and Kara Beth Lee and uh, Travis wrote up a group of patients and very early on, the labrum is already abnormal, and very early on, even with just a few weeks of symptoms and a mild slip, there can be damage to the articular cartilage. This is a patient that Michael Leunig published on who has a very mild slip, very mild slip on the left side, a few weeks of symptoms, a little bit of a limp, pain on internal rotation. Well, it's a very mild slip, but at the time of the arthroscopy, look at those spikes of bone on the metaphysis. It's a mild slip, but those teeth were grinding up against the acetabular cartilage causing lots of damage in a very, very mild slip and of not long duration. So follow-up six months, not long follow-up, but uh, Michael Leunig trimmed the bump off and had more importantly perhaps documented the damage that was already there. So this patient can be followed over time. I'm not saying that this is a big operation. Not, I'm not saying everyone should do arthroscopy for slips, but the bottom line that in this way we can document some of the damage that's already there and this is one way for treating slipped epiphysis and documenting the damage that's there. So the point is that even mild slips can cause damage quickly. The scope can see the damage. The bump can be resected by scope or open for mild slips. We still, of course, don't know exactly which slips are going to get into trouble clinically early or not. This is a patient who illustrates another problem. She'd been treated for nine months for knee pain on the right side, a right and left sided limp, much worse for one month, but still walking. This is a patient who Young Jo Kim treated. It's a pretty bad slip when you look at the frogs. Uh, but she was walking, and yet at the time of the surgical dislocation, it took just a little touch of Xiang Zhou's finger for that femoral head to fall off the neck. So there can be slips that clinically are stable and that the patients are still walking, but they're very, very close to being totally unstable. And it can be vice versa. So uh, this patient uh, slipped off with mineral dissection, open reduced after callus resection with the Don osteotomy. But the point is that the physical stability of the slip is uncertain. So what, uh, what Randy Loader and Steve Richards have taught us in the past may not hold up. What we found, what, what, uh, what the Bairn group and our group found out was that the Loader-Richards classification, when you look at the intraoperative stability, it only has 40% specificity and 75% sensitivity in detecting the truly unstable slips. So this is a little unsettling. So is the unstable slip usually an acute event? Well, no, not almost all of them have prior symptoms. And Tom McPartland looked at a group of our patients and almost 90% had symptoms more than 14 days. And remember, it's not quite sure how stable these slips are, so you know, we consider it of great public health importance to diagnose these patients much more quickly to avoid these catastrophic unstable slips. So unstable slips. Almost all of our unstable slips, grossly unstable, had symptoms for weeks. They weren't only obese boys. It's hard to predict which are unstable, as I've showed you, and pediatricians and orthopedists need this knowledge. What about the other hip? Is it slipping? Will it slip? Should we prophylactically pin it? Are there issues with the other hip even if it doesn't slip? Well, it turns out that at least 30% will ultimately be bilateral. But are there other issues with the other hip, even if it never slips? And the point is yes, because there's frequent FAI even if there's no slip. 
because retroversion of both femora and acetabulum is common, as Dennis pointed out this morning. The neck topography is often cami, if you can use that term, in the other hip. And uh, Terry Terryason is about to publish a large series, and we're looking at a series too, that we're going to report this uh, year, hopefully, at Pozna, about the fact that the other hip often has FAI, even if the slip never occurs. We can talk just for a minute about the choices for impingement relief. I don't think we need to go into the details of clinical uh, uh, clinical studies so much as to say that there's much new information on slips and only with long-term follow-up of old and new techniques are we going to do better than we already done and clearly prospective studies are uh, preferred. So in closing I'll just say that uh, slip epiphysis is not such a straightforward condition. The problem is not only with the physis and the problem is not only with the hip that slips. The other hip has to be looked at too. Thank you very much.